starting uh, last summer, the college has been involved with the state of Indiana in the coastal zone management program. Uh, particularly four of us, uh, John Russell, Umar Farouk from Landscape Architecture, Dave Johnson and myself from Planning, have been doing some work with the State Planning Services Agency. Uh, I have to admire John Russell. He managed to give the introduction today and then work it so that everybody who talks gives a plug for John Russell. That's very nicely done. So what I think I will do will be talk about the uh, coastal zone management program generally, because I think it's a very interesting kind of planning program, using some slides, some public relations slides that were prepared by the federal government, and then talk about the Indiana situation, talk very briefly about what we've been doing, uh, but talk primarily about the Indiana situation, which maybe is the, uh, the reality as opposed to the theory of coastal zone management. Okay, I'm not sure which of the projectors, uh, okay. Okay, I guess that's it. Um, see, how do the, do I turn the lights down here? Got it? More? Okay, fine. Okay, now as I said, this is a set of, uh, of uh, PR slides uh, prepared to discuss the general program. We have, you know, as you know, an immensely long coastline, Atlantic Ocean and Great Lakes. A series of things, increasing population pressure, have led to some concern about what happens to that coastline. In particular, there were a series of very specific environmental incidents, things like the, uh, the Santa Barbara Channel uh, oil spill, uh, some problems involving filling wetlands, coastal wetlands, and some scientific reinvestigation of what the value of some of those wetlands are, a series of things that kind of came together in the 1960s to create a concern about what was happening on the coast. Uh, there was some evidence that population in the US was tending to move heavily toward the coasts in both directions, uh, some concern that California was literally going to fall off and drop into the sea from population pressure. And the result of all this, a number of study groups looking into the problems of what was happening on the coastal zones. Among them in 1966, the Stratton Commission, which was formed to study and recommend a national oceans policy. At the same time, the Sea Grant program was established to provide for research, federally funded research into these activities. In 69, the Stratton Committee suggested that there should be a federal coastal zone management program to provide funding for coastal areas. Uh, oh, other, other kinds of natural disasters, the things leading up to a concern for uh, coastal zone management. And also this one, which was quite influential, and that is that, that you get a situation, as, as you get all of these problems in the coastal zone, uh, government responds, and it responds by setting up a particular regulatory program or imposing particular controls. And the image here uh, of the, is a fairly apt one for what a developer has to face if he wants to do anything in the coastal zone. Uh, he has to figuratively make his way down the row of windows, collecting an individual permit at each point. And the fact that he gets a permit at window one under zoning permits, for example, doesn't guarantee that he's going to make any progress at the second window or the third window and on down. And in a number of states, this led to a situation where land developers, uh, who might have been expected to be opposed to governmental controls, began to face a situation where they were being nickeled and dimed to death. There were so many separate governmental controls that the developers were beginning to say, we just can't live with this. What we've got to have is some kind of mechanism so we'll know once and for all. One-stop shopping was the idea. Some kind of procedure so we'll know in advance whether a project is going to go or not. Because as it stands, uh, we spend all of our effort running around from agency to agency, and maybe we collect five approvals, and then we get shot down on the six after spending two years of study and planning time. So this was an important private, private market support for the idea of coastal zone management. 
Okay, the upshot of all this, uh, 1972, the Coastal Zone Management Act, which was passed to provide federal funding to eligible states for coastal zone management activities. Uh, it's different from the traditional response in a number of ways. The traditional response dealt, traditional governmental response dealt with single functions, say with port erosion or port control, port development, erosion control, water quality, land use, individual elements. The coastal zone management program suggested that these things should be looked at as a body, as a total complex. Uh, the traditional programs dealt with a single resource, whether it was water, air, fish, groundwater, minerals. The new program suggested that uh, in, a, in common. The traditional programs tended finally to a kind of short run response, looking at an individual situation and saying, yes, you can do that or no, you can't. The coastal zone program proposed that these individual reviews should be related to a long-term plan of some kind. As it was set up, uh, this was to be a program involving the federal government and the states. It is not a direct federal control program. Uh, the federal role is to provide money and incentives to the states to develop individual state coastal zone management programs. Uh, at the federal level, the structure is that the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which is located within the Department of Commerce, is the, uh, the funding agency. The logic of this is that the, that's the agency responsible for other ocean-oriented programs generally. Uh, the problem is that that's not the agency that's responsible for other land use programs. And this is a continual problem in planning, whether it's federal level or state level, uh, putting the programs, figuring out where they should go so that they can best relate to each other. For better or worse, the program is in uh, commerce in the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. 30 states uh, plus uh, Puerto Rico, Guam, et cetera, were eligible for the program as outlined on this. And it includes the Great Lakes shoreline as well as the Atlantic Coast shoreline. So that Indiana uh, qualifies as a Great Lakes state, although having a very short stretch, 40-odd uh, miles of, of coastline here. The, the process, uh, NOAA funds the state. The state has to designate uh, a single recipient to be in charge of the process. Um, and the state then has to go through essentially a two-stage process. They have up to three years for a program development stage. And that is to be followed by program adoption. The difference is that they're, they're essentially giving you three years for planning to inventory the problems, uh, consider what resources you have, what the demands on those resources are. And then at the end of that time, you're supposed to arrive at a management program, uh, which can take a number of forms, but which will actually do something to concretely manage what happens in the coastal area. Uh, the process of developing this program during the first three years uh, is supposed to, as they suggest, build on a series of things, including, importantly, public hearings, and citizen participation generally. One of the important things the state has to do, each state has to do, is to delineate what it considers its coastal zone. Uh, the program is supposed to apply to those areas, only to those areas which have a direct and significant impact on the, uh, the water's edge, on the quality of the water resource. But that leaves it open as to how you're actually going to draw the line. You could draw it, as some states have been inclined to do, 100 yards from the beach and say, we're just concerned about the beach. If you draw it in environmental terms, you're going to follow all the little streams at least up to some distance back of the estuaries and the coastal wetlands. You may follow it all the way back to a watershed boundary. Uh, or in some cases, they've gone with a political jurisdiction. Namely, you just designate a whole tier of counties because that's a reasonable administrative unit. Um, but at any rate, you do have to designate that area to be affected. Uh, on the oceans, it goes out to 
the three mile limit of state jurisdiction on the Great Lakes shoreline, it's more complicated because you have to figure out how do you actually extend the state boundaries out into the lake uh, for purposes of deciding what Michigan does, what Indiana does, what Illinois does. Um, in developing this, you have to consider a series of related programs, which are already in the field, some of the EPA-funded programs, particularly the water quality programs and air quality programs. And in Indiana, air quality, the Indiana coastline, air quality in the Gary area may be as important as, as water quality considerations. Um, the process, I think they put this slide in uh, specifically to allay fears among the other federal agencies who were going around lobbying hard to make sure that their interests were going to be considered in this process, particularly the U.S. Navy that has full-time lobbyists going around from state to state to make sure that the states don't do anything that's going to adversely affect naval facilities. Uh, public hearings or citizen participation generally is supposed to be a very large element of the program. There have been some problems, I think, with it in Indiana, and which I'll get to. The upshot of all this is supposed to be an overall plan for the management of the coastal area, indicating generally what should be allowed where, what kind of priorities do we have, what does the public really want to do with the overall uh, coastline. This plan then goes to NOAA, to the Secretary of Commerce, if approved by the feds, if it meets their criteria and standards, the feds will then pay, it's a, it's a matching basis, they will pay the state part of the money necessary to conduct controls to carry out a coastal zone plan. And, well, uh, let me, just, oops, uh, yeah, I was trying to go backwards here. Okay, let me just back up to this. Um, the, the plan, the feds don't say exactly how you have to carry it out, but there are a number of options you can take. You can have, for example, you can have direct state control of what happens in the coastal zone, or you can have state level review of plans adopted at the local level. There's quite a bit of leeway as to how you want to go. All you have to assure is that there is some mechanism through which some kind of a unified public response can be given to what happens in the coastal zone. Okay, an additional incentive, uh, and a fairly strong one, is in so-called section 307, the federal consistency requirement. And this section says that once the state has come up with an adopted coastal zone program, the other federal agencies uh, must pay attention to that in their activities. The language is that each federal agency conducting or supporting activities affecting the coastal zone shall conduct those activities in a manner which is, to the maximum extent practicable, consistent with the approved state management program. Once a management program is approved, federal agency activities must also be consistent with the coastal zone management program of the state, and any applicants for federal licenses or permits must get a certification from the state that the activity is consistent with the state program. And for a lot of states, this has maybe been the most appealing reason for getting into the program, namely a feeling that once the state adopts a coastal zone program, they can use this in bargaining with the federal government rather than simply letting the feds walk all over them in coming up with individual facilities. Now, constitutionally, there's no requirement that says that the state can, can flatly forbid the federal government to do anything. Uh, there's, a, there's a fine line, but there is supposed to be a, a review process and the agencies, this, this language in here to the maximum extent practicable, there's some weaseling in that obviously, but the federal agencies are supposed to pay attention to the state program once adopted. Um, since the Management Act was adopted in 72, there's been one important set of amendments this year, 76, um, which are interesting in themselves, though they don't affect Indiana too directly. And those have to do with the impact of offshore oil development, particularly outer continental shelf. 
there's a, an awareness that because of, of energy problems in the U.S. and because of the need to develop uh, some deep water ports and some offshore oil facilities, some areas are going to be heavily impacted, like it or not. Some areas are going to have to have these facilities. It's in, in the nat national interest, probably, that we're going to have some uh, deep water port facilities with all the attendant problems of the possibilities of oil spill and everything that that creates. Um, we, we can't, in the national interest, allow a situation where each state or local government can flatly turn those things down. Because if, if everyone turned them down, uh, we would really be stuck in terms of meeting some of the overall national needs. What can be done, though, and what these 76 amendments do, is to essentially provide a mechanism whereby the winners pay off the losers. If some area is to have a facility, and if that's going to cause environmental problems, the 76 amendments provide funds which can be used essentially to uh, reduce the, the impact of those facilities, uh, to provide, in, in some cases, for a lot of measures that could be taken through, uh, through additional environmental facilities and things to try to reduce impacts, and monies which could be used to, uh, in effect, make it up to the areas in other ways by providing monies for shoreline acquisition, for acquisition of, of uh, islands, uh, uh, scarce environmental areas, and so on. So that if you, if you have to put up with a facility, a major facility, power plant, deep water port, whatever, uh, you will at least have some money with which to do some other things that will sort of help compensate for that process. Okay, well, let me, let me just switch then and uh, talk about the Indiana situation a little bit. Um, this is obviously not Indiana. Uh, this is. In response to the Coastal Zone program, the federal program, a number of states, well, not a large number, but some states have adopted formal controls of one kind or another over the coastal zone. California in 1972 passed a citizen referendum, uh, their so-called Proposition 20. Very interesting in that it wasn't the legislature that passed it. It was a group of concerned environmentalists who fought to get the necessary number of signatures to get this proposition put on the ballot and then got it passed by direct citizen vote to establish a series of state and regional commissions with fairly strong review powers over anything and direct control over land use in a strip a thousand yards deep from the shoreline. This was an example of a sort of direct state program, the kind of thing that would grow out of the three years of program development. North Carolina in 1974 passed a Coastal Area Management Act, creating a Coastal Resource Commission. The model they chose to follow was that the planning itself and the controls would be left as far as possible to the local county areas, and the state role would be to review these for consistency with an overall plan. Indiana has not yet adopted legislation. Indiana has been in the first year of a study program. Indiana was the last state to take advantage of the federal coastal zone program. They were the last state to get into the program. Uh, depending on what happened at a meeting this morning in Washington, they may be the first state to get out of the program. We hope not. Uh, but that is the situation at the moment. In Indiana, the State Planning Services Agency was designated as the state agency to be responsible for developing the, uh, the research and the proposals necessary to put together a coastal zone management program. In other words, they do not have, they don't have any control at the present time over what happens in the coastal zone. All they do they're just charged with carrying out the research, evaluating the resources, doing all of the planning studies, uh, and then to make recommendations two years, maybe three years down the road, to try to get an approved program. So for the moment, it's in a uh, what you would think would be a, a non-controversial situation 
which would become increasingly controversial and increasingly political uh, as you move toward actual controls. Um, let me just mention what some of the uh, some of the issues seem to be in the in the coastal area. Uh, we have a uh, compared to most other states a relatively short coastline, and yet within that short coastline, a dramatic contrast of uses, ranging from the uh, the heavily industrialized Gary uses that were in the aerial picture to dunes and, and beach areas. Um, these pose a number of, of questions as to uh, how this resource should best be used. In dealing with this, the, uh, the State Planning Services Agency has set up a series of three different citizen committees, citizen advisory committees, who are supposed to represent the different interest groups up in the area and to try to arrive at some statement of what the problems are. This was a meeting uh, earlier this fall up in Merrillville. Uh, on the wall in the background, behind the speaker here, is the map that uh, I believe Omar Farouk was primarily responsible for as part of the work that the college is doing uh, for the program. Uh, the, the work that we've been doing for them is in two stages. One by the landscape architects, primarily an attempt to evaluate the, the visual resources. In other words, they have some state agencies, particularly natural resources, are doing inventories of the, uh, the natural information, uh, groundwater, um, soil conditions, all of the things that, uh, that you're familiar with in terms of site analysis. Many of those things are being handled by state agencies. There was a feeling that an additional evaluation was needed simply of the, uh, the visual quality and the visual conflicts, uh, the possibility of whether you could have industrial and recreational and residential uses side by side if you could somehow manage the visual impacts of them. And this is the work that John Russell and Omar Farouk were primarily engaged in. Uh, Dave Johnson and myself from the planning department uh, were engaged in reviewing the work that came in, the, the research that came in from the different agencies for, to check for consistency in terms of was the information that was coming in from one regional planning commission up there, did that fit, did that mesh logically with the information from the next regional commission? And could we make suggestions about where the holes were in this data so that moving into the second year, we could better define what information was needed? Okay, the, uh, the committee, the Citizens Advisory Committee, had defined a number of, what, of issues that they considered to be sort of the, the primary problems up there. Uh, one of them having to do with uh, industrial uses. Uh, a large portion of the shoreline is already fairly heavily committed to industrial uses. Um, there are environmental problems attached to them, obviously, but there's also a very heavy economic and, and land use commitment, and there's no way you're going to turn around and, and simply move those things out. And even from a visual point of view, there's, a, there's an enormous amount of, of, of grandeur about some of these operations. Uh, this was right in the, the heart of Gary, uh, some of these heavy unloading processes. Uh, other issues that were identified were the issue of, of power development, and you're aware uh, this is has come to a head again because of the approval of the nuclear plant. Uh, this is up at, uh, I guess, Michigan City. Uh, and the impact, when you get out in a boat on the lake, you can literally see from one end of Indiana's shoreline to the other. It's that short, and you can mark the ends of the shoreline by smokestacks at each end, or by this, this large cooling tower uh, up here at one end and smokestacks at the other. Other issues that they defined were transportation, uh, both the land used by transportation and problems of inadequate transportation, despite all this. It's a very heavy transportation corridor. Uh, one of the major users of the coastal zone in Indiana is, in fact, the network of railroads and the parallel lines of interstates that go through that area. 
port development, uh, particularly Indiana Harbor. Uh, we were going out on a very rough day to try to take some pictures of the coastline. Uh, the state police took us out in a boat. We went a few miles down the shore. Then the state police decided it was really too rough and brought us all back with half of our team sort of clinging onto the bulkheads, looking green. Problems of recreational usage, uh, expanding numbers of boats, problems of how to accommodate uh, marina space, boat launching space in the context of this very heavily built up area. Also the problem of preservation of, of the dunes and the, uh, the beach areas that are left. Which raises one of the interesting questions for Indiana, and that is the very large percentage of the coastline that is already in federal control because of the, uh, the national lakeshore. There is, by the time you, you get done counting the land that's devoted to steel mills on the one hand, plus the steel mill expansion needs, and the land that's already or contemplated for inclusion in the Indiana Dunes lakeshore, there's some question as to whether you have enough land left to warrant going through the full-scale planning process, or whether there are already trends at work that determine automatically what's going to happen. Uh, final issue that they identified, um, the issue of, of shoreline erosion, which is a, a very hot issue with people having houses right on the lake shore particularly because of the high levels of the Great Lakes in recent years. Some question about whether those high levels are natural or are, have been influenced by man-made activities, diversion of water from Canada into Georgian Bay to try to raise lake levels to keep the St. Lawrence Seaway full and a variety of other things. But the impact has been that erosion, which is a natural process, has been proceeding faster than usual. And people have gone to great lengths to put up protective structures. Uh, the problem with protective structures is whether they really do the job or whether they simply literally throw money into the lake, plus having the effect of injuring their neighbors by diverting action over to adjacent structures. So shoreline erosion, there, there tends to be different groups tend to see different problems, but shoreline erosion is one of the ones that's really deeply felt by uh, residents up there. Okay, just to say a little bit about uh, what seem to be sort of political realities. Um, the, the program, and we've, we've really been struggling with this in terms of our relationship with the, uh, with the state. It seems as though there are some, some big political handicaps that make it very difficult to get the program off the ground. And they're some of the most interesting things about the whole program, I think. One is the, uh, simply the fact of political differences, Demo meaning simply Democratic-Republican differences. You've got a Republican state administration and a Democratic shoreline. That is to say that the counties uh, in the region, as what they refer to as the region, the area influenced more by Chicago than by the rest of Indiana, uh, are fairly heavily democratic. And coupled with some probably personality conflicts, the, the political differences between the region and the state uh, in fact create a great many problems for the program. Also, as I mentioned, the fact that it's a small, a fairly small length of shoreline adjacent to a very heavy concentration of population, uh, the Chicago area, the Gary area, um, the problems for Indiana are much more severe than they have been for a number of the other states. The nature of the uses that are already on the shore, as I mentioned, a large amount taken up by steel. And the steel people feel that, in a way, that they're being cast as the villains in the piece when they really shouldn't be. They say, after all, we were here first. And they have a point. Some of the, the steel mills were, in fact, built up there at a time when nobody considered that land good for anything. It was considered wasteland at the time that Gary was built as a planned industrial city uh, in 1902. And the steel people feel that it's the, uh, the later development that's come along that sort of hedged them in. And they feel that, that they had some kind of a prior claim on this. 
as a result of this, you get really a, a polarization of, of interest. You get U.S. Steel and Midland and Bethlehem probably on one side, feeling that they were there first, feeling that they're essentially trapped because these other areas have grown up around them and that they need land for expansion. On the other hand, you get the Save the Dunes Council and the Isaac Walton League and a series of environmental groups uh, who feel almost paranoid about the, uh, what they see as the unholy alliance of, of industry and government trying to convert what remains of the coast into industry. So you have a very polarized situation. And the result of all this has, has been uh, really that the, the citizen participation process, while it's there on paper, has yet to work in fact. Um, there are meetings, material is presented to the committee, but the most interesting thing is to see how the, simply how people arrange themselves in the space at those committee meetings. We had a, that one that I showed a slide of, had a horseshoe table down one whole side of the table were representatives from Midland Steel, Bethlehem, U.S. Steel, Midland, Bethlehem, down that side of the table. Down the other side of the room were the environmentalists. Uh, when they split for coffee breaks, there was one line of U.S. Steel, Bethlehem Steel, Midland Steel getting coffee from one pot, and the Save the Dunes Council, et cetera, getting coffee from the other. Um, the, it's a, a kind of politically explosive situation. And the result of all of that has been that um, this has played back into the, the political differences, the, the sheer Democratic-Republican differences, with the result that the Regional Planning Commission up there has attacked the state, uh, has said that the state's coastal zone management program is really inadequate, uh, went some distance to persuading the federal agency that this was the case. And what's happening, hopefully, this morning in Washington is that the lieutenant governor and the state planning officer uh, are going to be able to persuade Washington that Indiana really should continue in this program. I think it would really be a shame if the state dropped out of the program. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's kind of a case study in political realities versus the uh, the ideal nature of programs as presented in some of the public relations slides. Uh, Indiana, probably more than most states, needs some kind of a process of this sort. The question is whether, given political realities, it can really be made to work or not. OK, I think that's all I would like to say about that. I, I think it's a very interesting program, and I'm glad that we've had a chance to be involved in it. I hope it continues. Thank you.